All right. So hello everyone and welcome to High Tech Live. For those that are new to our High Tech Live sessions, bienvenidos. I'm Viviana Costa, I'm the Executive Director of High Tech. We are so thrilled to have you join us today to learn, engage, and be inspired. Today, we're gonna to chat with Cisco's customer experience team on inclusive innovation and the future of work. So today we have with us Carlos Pignataro, who's the Chief Technology Officer for Cisco's $13 billion customer experience organization. We also have with us David Stanford, Senior Director of Breakthrough Innovation for the Customer Experience Chief Technology Office, and Paul Hirat, Distinguished Engineer in the Customer Experience Chief Technology Office. Welcome. So this session is meant to be engaging and interactive. We're gonna have some time for Q&A and we're using a new feature, Slido for questions. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later on. So have your questions ready. Our panelists are also gonna be joining us for some networking at the end of the session. So if you're able to, please stick around. So we are all now living in this new normal of remote work and soon to be, if not already, moving into a hybrid model of work, which is both office and virtual. And this Cisco customer experience team are driving innovation in this new normal that organizations are facing today. It is so much more than products and applications. It is technology coming together under a unified architecture to provide a seamless employee experience. I'm really happy to welcome and introduce Carlos Pignataro, Cisco's customer experience chief technology officer, who was also recognized by high tech as one of our 100 most influential Hispanic leaders in tech last year. So we've got a High Tech 100 award, awardee here. Welcome. Carlos has built 20 plus year career driven by a passion and curiosity for technology excellence, outside in thinking and creating opportunity for technical professionals. He likes to think of innovation as a movement and he cares deeply about making an impact for his customers, his teams and the global community. He values being a mentor and working for a more diverse and inclusive workforce. I also wanna highlight a few of Carlos's many, many, many accomplishments. He's got a long list, but there's three that really stood out to me. He is the third ranking patent holder and top American inventor at Cisco. He has co-invented more than 190 patents issued with the USPTO. And Carlos has authored, co-authored several books on computer networking and is a much sought after speaker around the world. I'm not sure how you have time for all this, Carlos, but it's amazing. Felicidades. So he's also received numerous awards, including High Tech 100. So we are so incredibly honored and excited to have Carlos lead today's conversation. Carlos, welcome. Viviana, muchas gracias. Thank you very, very much for that very, very kind introduction. Uh, this is the meeting that I've been looking forward uh, all the week. Uh, you know, as I prepare my calendar, what are the things that, that you're truly looking forward to? And this is one. Viviana, because of what you said, because of the engagement and education and enablement element, uh, and I would love to keep a very dynamic dialogue. Uh, we're going to use some technology, Slido, uh, to actually get some of these questions, both up, both down. Um, I want to start by thanking, you know, Viviana, Leah, Maria for for you know, uh, Omar, the invitation uh, for us to be here that, that we will absolutely take. And we're uh, talking about a fairly, fairly relevant topic, uh, which is uh, something that I'm very passionate about as well. You know, Viviana, my passions are people and technology. And truly in the intersection of those two is where we find inclusive innovation. And today we're gonna be talking about innovation, particularly as it pertains uh, you know, the newer normals that we're going to continue seeing and, and how uh, our life, work, friend, family, uh, remote hybrid situation is going to continue to be empowered to evolve by different technologies. Um, thank you, Viviana, for introducing Dave and, and Paul as well. Uh, I'm going to have Paul actually explain to us how to use the Slido feature with the QR code that you're seeing and how to get questions. And then we'll just dive into the content. Thank you, Carlos. Um, so yeah, like Carlos mentioned, uh, we're gonna be using a great new feature in um, part of our WebEx suite actually called Slido, which is gonna let you interact with us in question and answer sessions, polls, and quizzes. Uh, we're going to ask that if you do have questions throughout the session that you actually ask them in Slido. 
to, add, to access the Slido, either you can use your mobile app. So just scan that QR code with your phone and you'll have the polls and the questions there. Or if you just want to use a web browser, go to this link Slido or Slido.com and type that code HITECH and the passcode XASKA3. Um, so I'll give everybody a couple seconds to go ahead and do that. And we really encourage everyone to go in and participate. I think it'll be a little bit of fun that we'll have through here. And once you've done that, um, you should have the opportunity to answer this question. So just as an icebreaker to understand where everybody's coming from, we'd like to know what industry do you work in? Are you in healthcare or education, university, technology sector, um, medical, et cetera? So let's just get an idea of what our, our crowd looks like here. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of IT professionals, but even IT, you know, what part of the industry do you work in, right? Are you IT for um, a hospital system or are you IT for, um, you know, big bank, financial institution, retail industry, right? So it looks like eight people have come in and answered so far. Carlos, you had a comment. No, I, I just wanted to say, Paul, I forgot. Our ticket of entry is to say something in Spanish, so you need to do a greeting or something in Espanol. Well, uh, muchas gracias por tenerme aquí y, uh, y mucho gusto por, por todo. <laughs> I love, I love it. All right, so it looks like we've got 11 folks um, that are here and, and joined the slide on and answered some questions. We've got definitely a lot of people in technology and we're gonna be talking about a lot of technology here. So Carlos, do you wanna take it from here and talk about how we do some innovation? Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have built together um, a, what we think is a great agenda for today because we're gonna progressively be talking about a set of topics that build up on each other. How we allow ourselves to innovate, what are some of the challenges and opportunities on, on the future of work, and how do we use these two things to capitalize on that, on that challenge and opportunity in order to innovate the future of work. And I'm going to start talking about um, how we allow ourselves to innovate because, um, you know, Viviana mentioned, uh, you know, some of the visual, vis some of the tip of the innovation iceberg uh, as it pertains some of my experience. So I have uh, a number of patterns. When I think about that, me personally, uh, there were quite a number of self-imposed hurdles that I had to go over. And, and that is really what I call the myths of innovation. Um, my invitation, our invitation today is that we look at these fairly close in the eye and, and see how they potentially apply to us and, and, and what, what we do about it. Because I remember from when I was a child talking to my mom saying, uh, everything was invented already. I love inventing, tinkering. However, I am not Da Vinci. I am not you know, this single person who is gonna have all these massive inventions. And, and interestingly enough, you know, talking about patents, my first patent was working on customer support, solving a customer case in something that you might think is less traditional for innovation. Um, part of my invitation today is, is to allow ourselves to think that innovation is something that is enabled for all of us and available to all of us as long as we allow ourselves. My first pattern, like I mentioned, was uh, on a call center solving a customer problem. And, and it really takes the identification of that problem, a creative solution uh, to bring innovation. So uh, I want to say that, you know, for all of us, the first myth um, on uh, things that prevent us from innovate is debunked, um, busted. There you go. Thank you. And uh, it was interesting that many of us are in the technology field in the in the first icebreaker question that Paul was showing. Uh, however, one of the things that I often hear is also, well, to innovate, 
to have access to innovation, you need to be a very deep technical person. Innovation happens only when someone is coding, research and development, deep technology. And interestingly to me, many of the key innovations that I saw in my career within the company, within Cisco, have to do with how we process things differently, how we change a process. For example, um, you know, how do we do something differently, which is not necessarily the depth of technology. And my uh, experience, one of the things that I often say is that innovation is a team sport. And that is because the more that we can actually have diverse set of experiences that we bring into a problem or opportunity, the larger the surface of potential ideas that, that we're going to get. And many of the ideas uh, that are now patents started with a non-technical person, identifying a creative way that you know someone who is very technical just jump into finger to keyboard and, and uh, trying to solution it from a technical perspective. Uh, I will invite all of us to be inclusive as we think about the future of work and, and how do we actually contribute to changing that future. So, uh, you know, myth number two on uh, innovation myth and things that prevent us from innovate, busted as well. And, uh, and I also had a third myth with, which, um, you know, I think about this one, I don't know how much is cultural I don't know how much is uh, upbringing or personality. However, the concept of failure was something that was a little bit taboo in, uh, you know, when I was thinking about innovation. Failure was the opposite of innovation in my, in my early vocabulary and, and dictionary. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the very early times in which uh, I was faced with something different was, was actually by my mom as well, when she told me uh, the story of how Dulce de Leche um, was invented or discovered, I don't know, let's say invented. And uh, it was by a mistake. It was someone boiling milk at a campsite and putting a lot of sugar and then forgetting about it and go do something else. And when they came back, they were preparing breakfast for some general or so the story goes. And, uh, you know, they made a mistake of over boiling the, the milk with sugar, letting it there for too long. They empty um, the, uh, the, the place where they're boiling it. And in the end of this gooey brown thing, and, and instead of throwing it away, someone tried it out and it was actually very yummy and very delicious. And, and, and now, uh, you know, one of the five elements, you know, next to water, earth, air, and dulce de leche, and, and maybe one more, uh, or, or that's how we think about it. So um, it took me actually quite a few years to internalize the concept that uh, a failure is a failure if I don't learn something from it. And, uh, you know, many, many, many ways of learning. So I will invite us to truly, truly, you know, Roseanne, thank you, goodness for the mistake for sure. You know, and thank you for Dulce de Leche. Uh, I will invite us to allow ourselves to, um, to fail, to, to not put an additional negative emphasis on a concept of learning and part of learning is failing. So. Um, you know, we're going to talk during the rest of the presentation about how the world is changing, how the world is different, and, and different innovations in that respect. And I will actually invite us to celebrate some of the failures that, that are going to result in innovations. So um, when we look at how the world is, is actually changing, uh, there's two ways of looking at it, right? Number one is uh, how we see it with our children at school, with ourselves at work, when we're uh, you know, going to the grocery store or, or finding ways of, of buying. 
but there's also a more quantifiable way. And I think we transition into um, a quote um, that we have in terms of uh, the future. And you know, in my role at Cisco, we, we look at technology transitions and architectural transitions and, and how we, we capitalize with them. So uh, particularly on this IDC report, uh, there's a very quantifiable way of looking at innovation as it pertains to the future of work. With this, Dave Stanford, I'm going to transition the presentation to you, and you can tell us about how the landscape is changing. Absolutely. Thanks, Carlos. And, and I will say my Spanish is probably a little bit more rusty, but vivi en México cuatro años. Soy canadiense, pero dos hijos mexicanos. Y necesito hablar más. Uh, estoy muy feliz para la oportunidad de acompañarlos en este evento. Este, este evento. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I tried. So I need more practice, but thank you. And um, another poll, right? A question, you know, what does the future of work mean to you? Obviously, the future of work is not something that's coming. It's already here. It's starting to evolve. We need to get to the next level. So please feel free, you know, let us know what you're thinking. And as we talk to this, you'll see some different things that we're thinking. And, and don't think just IT, right? There's a lot of other things that the future of work means for different industries, different opportunities. So you can see one of the biggest things, and as I talk a little bit, flexibility is key for most companies, most employees. Uh, one funny thing that came out of Canada this week, a study it said that 25% of employees in Canada would actually quit their jobs if they were forced to go to the office full time and look for something different. So flexibility is definitely key. And you see there's a lot of different things here. Collaboration, versatility, knowledge. I think we're going to touch on all of these. So this is great, Paul, if you want to go to the next slide. And so work today is what you do. It's not where you are. We, we've all seen over the past year, we've gone from traditional offices where we go nine to five, we take our lunch breaks, we take our meetings and we're home and we forget about everything. Now I know not everybody you know, has a job like that where they can forget about everything and, and you'll leave it for the next day. But you see the new era of work and really it was forced upon a lot of us over the last year, anyone that wasn't already doing this, it's hybrid. It's all over the place. It's in the office, it's at home, it's in the coffee shops, it's in the airports for many people who travel. So connectivity, collaboration, inclusion, very important. Everybody needs to have that same opportunity to be able to participate. And I think that's probably the most important thing that we're going to talk about in the IT space, right? We can actually evolve the way we do business in the future. One thing we need to think about over the last year, I mean, this is, is really, like I said, been forced on us. I don't even know if there's a concept of work-life balance anymore, right? Work is life and life is work. And sort of you have your kids at home, you have your family at home, you have to go do things in the middle of the day. So it's not just, hey, I'm going to do eight hours. I'm going to do everything else. You have to make you know, things more flexible. So Paul, if you want to go to the next slide. And this is another poll. Uh, this is very interesting. We've seen a lot of results within Cisco and, and outside of it. But what percentage of time do you expect employees to be in the office post-pandemic? We did a recent uh, leader check-in and employee check-in at Cisco. And we asked, like, how much do you want to be in the office? Do you want to be there 100, 75? Nobody said they wanted to be in the office 100%. Out of everyone in that you know, check-in, nobody said they wanted to be there 100%. There was flexibility. Uh, I will tell you, even within our CX centers, we've hired 1,400 people over the past year during the pandemic. 1,400 of those people have never been to a Cisco office. So it's going to be interesting when we go back to work. How are we going to fit these people in the office? Is it going to be hybrid? Obviously, it has to be hybrid. So this is very interesting. You can see most people... We'll expect at least 20%, and that depends on your role, too, and with the organization or the, or the industry you're in. So thanks, Paul, if you want to go to the next slide. So another poll, you know, what's your top concern for the future of work? Is it pro productivity? Um, that's always been a concern in the past, right? You have to make sure that you trust your employees to do it. I think that productivity, it's been shown over the last year, we can do this. You can trust people to work from home. There should never be a concern about trust. I think the work-life balance, like it's being pointed out here, is a challenge. We used to have that commute in the morning. You'd go to the office. You'd go in. You'd meet someone at the water cooler. You'd have a chat. Now it just seems like, initially when we started, especially, 
you were in meetings all day long, no breaks in between. And our leadership has always been concerned about that. In Cisco, they want you to be able to, to have your meetings, but to decompress, to make sure you have the right time to focus, the right time to spend with your family as well. So that's definitely inclusion is something I'm going to touch upon as well. So thanks, Paul. And thanks for everybody for answering these polls. So if you want to go to the next slide, Paul. So I just had to interject yep. there because a customer gave me this quote the other day that like really stuck to me. He said, I don't work from home. I live at work now, right? You're, yeah. you're living in the place that you're working in, and it's been a paradigm shift. So it's clearly a, a top of mind issue with this work-life balance. So, Yeah, and, and if you think about it, right, five years, 10 years ago, if you're working from home and your kids walk through the background, you kind of panicked and you said, okay, you know, you're trying to shuffle in the way, but now it's, that's the normal, normal thing, right? We're in our kitchens, we're in our bedrooms, there's kids everywhere, there's family. And most instances over the last year, we've all had to work from home. I think one of the big things, it's not the productivity loss. People working from home actually work harder, but it's from what I've seen, right? Over the last year, the productivity loss is when we don't have the remote access. We're not prepared. We don't have the bandwidth. So we've gone from one person working potentially at home, you know, 50% of the time to sometimes families of more than four all on the internet, all on the web at the same time. So there's, there's going to be throughput issues. There's going to be equipment issues. I mean, people are struggling and mental health is a big challenge, right? And that comes back to the work-life balance, being in the office all the time. Like you said, Paul said, living in your office. Only 19% of the people that want to say goodbye. I think socialization is a big thing. And I think we've missed a lot of that over the last year, that water cooler talk. How do we go have a coffee for someone, have lunch with someone? So some of these different trends, Cisco is working on it along with some of the partners and our employees. And, and this team, you know, the CX CTO office that Carlos leads, trying to innovate around this space is going to be key. And it's not just about technology. It's not around, you know, networking and software and routers and switches. It's around some of the insights, some of the analytics, how do we make the, the experience more enjoyable? How do we actually improve the employee experience? So Paul, if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. So what do we need to do? And this is some of the things that Cisco has come up with, right? 94% of employees want tools to improve their collaboration. So what does that mean? Does that mean I want a video you know, device at home? Do I need better wireless? Do I need to know how to troubleshoot? For those who are going back to the office, it needs to be a safe return. Obviously, we need to make things simpler to, to navigate. Uh, with COVID, different protocols are going to be in place. So obviously, we want to make sure that they feel safe at work and encouraged. If they want to go, they can go. If employees are not comfortable enough, we need to have the same experience, actually a better experience for people who work at home than the ones in the office. I mean, honestly, how many times have you felt like, hey, I work from home. There's 10 people in a meeting in, in, the, in the boardroom and I'm sort of left out, I'm raising my hand, but I don't see you know, anybody answer me. I'm sort of you know, considered like, you're not here because you're in the office, you're, at, you're working from home. So we're trying to do things that make that better. And Paul will show some of the different tools. Now, with that said, technology really needs to make the world a better place. We sometimes think about it in the perspective of Cisco, we're an IT company, we wanna connect, we wanna collaborate. But what about education? What about health? What about all these different industries, these businesses who have struggled over the last year because you know, it was thrown upon them. They didn't have an online presence. They couldn't do this, right? And if you think about it, 40% of the world today doesn't even connect to the internet. They have nothing. So I mean, we need to actually change that. And Cisco is doing some different things to provide that access to different, different countries, different people. So honestly, internet, the future of work should be able to address fundamental, fundamental human needs and human rights and access. Everybody needs this access for education, for information. I mean, just the fact that, you know, we've seen over the last year, we can access a doctor on demand and get health coverage. That's key. I mean, everybody should be able to do that. Now, it needs to be beneficial to everyone. So our products should actually be looking at that. It should be distilled into there, right? It has to be inclusive. We need to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And obviously, you know, inclus inclusivity should be at the heart of whatever we do. So everything you're gonna see around future of work definitely is inclusion. And so we need to make sure that we do this, we're successful, and there's some different things we need to do. And so 
Paul, if you want to go to the next one, you've seen sort of in the Slido poll earlier, this matches some of the key words, right? So flexibility, inclusion. And when I say managed, we want to be able to help support people to manage them, to, to bring them if they have issues with wireless, how do we support them, right? Do we send them equipment? Do we like do things on demand? Support and manage go hand in hand. And security is key. If you think about it, the majority of people who've connected remotely over the past year have actually done it just over the internet. A lot of them haven't been over SD-WAN or VPNs. They've just had a pure internet connection. So that's, that's a little bit not troubling, but I say a concern for both companies and for individuals because companies want to make sure the data is secure. The individuals want to make sure their personal information is secure. And when you're doing that, you have both your corporate and your personal information on the same network, on the same equipment. So definitely security is top of mind. Now, some of the challenges, I won't read through all of these, but like I said, that seamless collaboration. How many times have you been on a meeting where you know, they said, oh, it's my video, my video is bad, I dropped, I have a bad connection. How do we get further? How do we determine where that is, right? We wanna make sure it's seamless, that employees, that workers, that students, everybody who has access can adopt new technologies and operating models and that we change the limited skill sets. So you'll see in the next you know, slide, I have some thoughts around what we can do around technologies and education. So thanks, Paul, please go ahead. So this is really the core principles that we need to follow for the future of work. We need to impact the community. And so when I talk about the community, that's our local community, our, our countries, our global community, look at different, different types of in, in, uh, in areas that we wanna help, whether it's with homelessness, with education, with poverty, we need to do that as a community. And the company has to drive that. We wanna support diverse employees and suppliers. We wanna make sure we have opportunities for everybody to be able to connect, to be able to, to bring the future of work to their customers, to other people. That also calls for investing in digital and education, digital skills and education. If it is digital, if it can be digital, we have to do it, but we have to bring these opportunities. So things like the Cisco Networking Academy for students, this has been, you know, millions of students have actually gone through the Cisco Networking Academy to get these digital skills. And we wanna partner with social change agents. Carlos does a lot of things in our team and I have to call it out, Carlos, you do a lot of different volunteering and, and you know, it, it, it makes a big difference to the world, right? If everybody can do something like that, definitely it brings some change. And then just continue with the progress, right? There's a lot of things we're going to do. It's not just about technology. Digital acceleration, yes, we can talk about that. But progress also means including everybody, getting everybody's point of view. Everything we do in innovation around the future of work, the more diverse perspectives we have, the more successful we're going to be. If it's always the same two or three people have the same ideas, we're never going to move ahead. So our principles we need to follow, definitely, this is the only way to progress, is to include everybody and get that diverse perspective. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Paul and um, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, David. Um, so you, we all understand the challenges that this new world of work brings, but how do we solve this? And I'm not here to tell you that Cisco is going to solve all of these problems, right? We're a technology company. We're uh, embedded in a lot of, of the areas that are causing these challenges, but we're not going to be able to do it alone. It's going to take an ecosystem of technology partners, of just cultural change, of mindset change. I had a conversation with some customers um, in Latin America last week, and there's some customers who are saying, I want all my employees back in the office. I don't want them at home. And it's not because they're not being productive at home. It's because there's this mindset that if I don't see them physically at a desk working, I don't know that they're getting their work done. So it's as much about technology as it is mindset and trusting our employees to be able to work in this new type of environment. And the reality of the situation is that today's workplace is really not designed for hybrid work. You know, we were all thrust home saying, all right, go work from home and, and make do. And it was very painful early on. Nobody had the tooling. I mean, I could tell you a whole long story on how our WebEx platform load increased by five times the amount of traffic that it had from one month to the next and how we had to scale that up. But it, it's not just about the technology piece, it's, it's people's Wi-Fi at home, the ability to actually connect to your applications because now they don't have VPN connectivity, et cetera. 
So that was one big transition, but now as we transition back into the office and this new hybrid model, we're gonna see some growing pains as well going back because now you're gonna have people that are at home and in the office and how do we make sure that they interact and collaborate um, effectively in that type of environment? Because it's almost easier to say, yeah, if everybody's at home, we can solve for that problem. Everybody is at least on a, on a level playing field. It might not be the greatest, but we're, we're at an equal footing, right? When you have people half in the office and half remote, it causes all sorts of new challenges that we need to address. Now, Cisco's got a huge portfolio of products, right? And, and I'm not here to sell you on our products. I, I'm here to tell you just more in general that this is a lot more than just about WebEx or Zoom or Microsoft. It's really about taking a look at the bigger picture of what are really the challenges that ensue when you have people working remotely and in the office and how do you connect them together in a secure way, because I can assure you that a lot of companies opened themselves up to a lot of security vulnerabilities at the beginning of this pandemic when they just said, all right, we're gonna give people access to these applications over the internet or open up holes in the firewall just because we have to get it working. You know, Our business needs to continue, but we gotta go back now and say, all right, let's really take a look at our business and make sure that we're secure, that we're offering the connectivity and the capabilities that our employees need but in a secure way. And that means probably moving a lot of things to the cloud because we don't want to necessarily be sending that traffic over a VPN back to your corporate environment. But now how do you ensure security behind that? So zero trust is a huge topic right now where we want to be able to offer our capabilities without VPN, but still be able to make sure that we um, we trust the employee's endpoint. And there's some really cool innovations that are coming down the pipe regarding authentication and the ability to make sure that the person who's accessed the information really is the person who's accessing who they say they are. So there's really great things coming down the pike, but the important thing is here is this is about more than just a meetings platform or a way to make a phone call from your PC. It's a holistic approach and that's what our customer experience team is looking at. How do we take all of these technologies and put them together and give them to you as a customer in a way that you can digest. Because if I tell you go buy 20 different products, you're just gonna be completely overwhelmed. So how do we give you a technology stack that you can say, all right, I wanna enable this remote worker, take these technologies, package them together, send them a box to their house, and they're gonna have everything they need to collaborate, for example. But along with that comes visibility as well. One of the big challenges with people working remotely is now I don't have any visibility into their network, their home Wi-Fi, how they're connecting. So if they call to your IT desk and say, I'm having a problem, I can't connect to a WebEx meeting, or I can't off access this office document, you have very little visibility into what's happening in their environment. So we're doing a lot of work in trying to give you that level of visibility so that you have the tools that you need to be able to diagnose and troubleshoot issues effectively. So, got a, a few quiz questions now. So this one's a, a little bit of a test now. Uh, it's not really a test, but we're gonna ask you to answer questions and there are correct answers to these questions. So please go and just enter your name um, so you can answer the, the quiz. We will have a leaderboard and you know somebody will win a, a prize of, I'm sorry, I don't have anything good to give away, but bra bragging rights of who answered the most correct questions. So the first question today is going to be, on average, how much money can an individual worker save by working remote? So if they don't have to drive into the office and all the things associated with that, how much money can they save as an individual? All right, so let's see the results. So 38% and said two to seven and 38% said seven to 10. So the correct answer here is between two and $7,000 per year, which, that, that's not a small sum, right? Because now you don't have to drive to the office. You're not stopping by that Starbucks and paying $6 for a coffee every day. So it all kind of adds up to some money saving for the employees themselves. Now let's turn around. How much will the business save by you having an employee sitting at home instead of sitting in an office space? So it's 9,000, 11, 13, 15. What do you all think as far as savings to the business itself? 
right, so results are in, and most people said 15,000. Um, the answer here was 11,000, which is still a pretty significant chunk of change. Now, that's great. Saving money is great. Everybody wants to save money, but at what cost? Which sounds a little bit ironic, right? Well, I'm saving money, so the cost is less. Well, there's still a cost to being at home. If you're not going to be as productive or if you're not going to have that work-life balance or you're not going to be happy working from home, sure, you save money, but you're not better off because you're not getting as much work done or you're not happy doing that work. So just sending somebody home to do work is not the whole equation. Yes, money savings is important, but we have to make sure that we balance that with making sure they have the tools to be effective. So Cisco's vision from a collaborations perspective is to create 10 times better experience than just a standard in-person interaction. Now, that's obviously a very lofty goal and how do you measure what 10 times is? But the whole point of this vision really is that we really want to enhance the experience and really make it a better experience than you would have just having two people sitting in a room talking to each other. Um, and the way that we're gonna do that is through collaboration experiences that are inclusive so that we can bring in diverse talent, people from all over into that conversation. So maybe you wouldn't have been able to fly to that room, but can we bring them in virtually in such a way that they add to that conversation, add to that experience and give you the tools to collaborate effectively. Um, and we really do think that the way to do this is a full stack approach. So it's not just, like I said, it's not just a, a meetings platform like WebEx. It really is taking the whole solution and making it work cohesively so that you have uh, something that works better than the sum of its parts. Now, some of the areas that we're working on for hybrid work experiences is first of all, um, we need to make sure that the work is engaging and secure. So security is top of mind for everything that we do um, from a hybrid work perspective, because again, now we have people that might be working in a Starbucks or at home or somewhere else, and you don't have control over that network. But at the same time, we need to make sure that people are not getting fatigued. So we, we're releasing a new feature in WebEx called People Insights, which not just tells you, okay, you had this many meetings or you were this productive, but it, it's actually the opposite. It's like, hey, you might be having too many meetings. Did you know that you had back-to-back -back meetings all day for you know, three days last week and you didn't have a break for lunch? So we wanna be able to give people insights into things that might be actually causing them fatigue and stressing them out. And as much as we would like people to use more meetings, we actually want people to have less meetings. We, we want meetings to be the exception where something is getting done because it requires that in-person interaction. But when it doesn't, we want to have other ways of collaborating and making sure that you can get work done that does not involve having to be stuck on a meeting every day. And we also want to make sure that everybody has the ability to participate equally because you don't want to be that person on the speaker phone where there's no video in the room and you can barely hear the people in the room and you can't get a word in because you, nobody can hear you speaking on that phone, right? So we wanna make sure that everybody is included in the conversations, taking things to the point of making sure that the tools actually point out, hey, this person hasn't spoken in a while. Do you wanna give them the opportunity to do that um, without being you know, embarrassing or calling somebody out necessarily? So we wanna make sure that we do things in such a way that protect privacy, but also make sure that people are included. Um, I talked to a customer earlier this week, before the pandemic, everybody had a desk, their own dedicated space that they worked at. Over the past 18 months, they have been ripping out all the cubicles and ripping out all the equipment in conference rooms and replacing it with shared workspaces, with more collaboration equipment in conference rooms, video, et cetera, because they fully expect that we even saw in the poll, you know, most of you said people are only going to be going to the office 20% of the time. That's one day a week, right? One day a week. This customer said they kind of expect people to be coming twice a month and they're going to have their teams schedule things so that two days a month you come in to do some in-person activity and then the rest of the time they think they're just more productive working from home. So how does the workspace change? We're not going to have dedicated cubes for everybody. But now when you walk into your office, 
how do I find that space? How do I not sit there for 10 minutes at some kiosk, punching something in to find a place to work, right? So personalize the hot desking so that you walk into that environment and it's yours. Everything is configured, your phone number rings there. You can, <laughs> excuse me, you can connect to all the things that you need to and people know that you are there, right? So adding more video, making them smart, making them touchless. Um, and we also think that integrating tools is really important as well. We realize not everybody's gonna use WebEx. Some people might be using Zoom. Some people might be using Microsoft Teams. Pretty much everybody's using Microsoft Office products, but maybe they're using G Suite um, for slides or for word processing. So how do we make all these tools actually work together across vendors so that we can have a, a more seamless experience? Now, of course, we're gonna try to tell you that if you buy all Cisco, it's gonna work better than everybody else's. But the reality is that that's not the real world, right? People use different vendors and we need to make sure they interoperate and interoperability with other, other vendors is um, definitely top of mind for us. Now, once you have this new environment, it's gonna be, it's gonna take some time to figure out exactly how things are gonna work. Like we don't really know how people are gonna operate in this new hybrid model and what they're gonna wanna do and what type of workspaces they're gonna to gravitate to. So we need to be able to measure that and know, hey, a lot of people are going to this one part of the building most of the day, but this other part of the building is not getting used. Or we have 25 people conference rooms, but it seems like there's only ever two or three people that are in those rooms at any given time. So to be able to measure what's happening so that you can then optimize that space is gonna be really critical in this new hybrid world. And then finally, just how do we connect with our customers? If anything, this pandemic has showed us that there's lots of new ways to connect with customers. You might not have thought of doing virtual healthcare two years ago, but now most of our, us are pretty much okay with doing a video call with your doctor and having a conversation without having to go to the, the office anymore. A lot of people are like, hey, I'm gonna save a lot of time by not having to drive to the doctor's office anymore. I'd be happy to continue doing this. So we need to meet our customers where they want to be and make sure that we offer these experiences, not just internally within our environment, but between us and our customers as well to make sure that they have ways to engage with us in a way that they want to connect with us. So we got another question here. Everybody ready? We got 23 people. The question is what percentage of future meetings will have at least one remote participant? So we're in a meeting, how many meetings will have at least one remote participant? And this is based on some research that Cisco has done. All right, all right, you guys got it right. So 98%, you guys have probably been listening to some Cisco presentations, but 98% of remote or of future meetings will have at least one remote participant, which means that this has to work well, this has to be inclusive, if not, it's really just not gonna work very well. So I'm not gonna go through all the different features, but to add this uh, inclusivity and productivity into our platform, we've done things like being able to give you custom layouts and immersive share so you can show up in front of the, your presentation. Um, availability and presence is really important, knowing that you can reach out to somebody. Before when you were in the office, you'd kind of like walk by their cubicle and you saw them on the phone, you were like, all right, I'll, I'll stop by later. Well, you can't just walk by their house anymore. And so it helps to know if somebody is available or not. And we're even thinking about how to extend things like presence into other ways of just knowing whether somebody is available because maybe they're not on a call and they're not on a meeting, but they really don't want to be disturbed right now because they're actually getting some work done. You know, it's the one hour they have between meetings. So making sure that people are, are available to be interrupted for some of these casual conversations at the same time, letting other people know when they're not available as well. And we started doing some works in meeting templates as well. So certain meetings have certain formats. For example, for we, we have a platform for called WebEx Legislate, which is for legislatures to actually vote on bills. And they have very specific rules that you get five minutes to talk and you know, all sorts of rules on how the format is. Well, that applies to lots of different things. In education, there's a format to how a class might flow. 
in a board meeting, it might flow in a certain way. So can we enable those tools to facilitate the flow of those conversations and make it easier for you to have these meetings? And then we also wanna make sure you just have ad hoc meetings as well. So I've got three people, I wanna have a meeting right now. I should just be able to click and start having a meeting with those people without having it to be a scheduled meeting that's happening um, in the future. Now, in addition to these kind of low level features that I like to call them, we're really trying to embed AI into our platforms as well. There's a few things that have already come to, into play. For example, um, our noise cancellation cap capability, we were actually releasing a new feature next month, which is called My Voice. So not only does it cancel you know, noise and barking dogs and, and babies crying, but it'll actually cancel other people's voices as well and only focus in on your particular voice so that if there's somebody talking in the background while you're in the office, they're not gonna get heard over your meeting. So it makes the experience much better for everyone. And we're also looking at how can we have intelligence in the meeting that can actually not just transcribe what's happening in that meeting, but make that searchable. So I can search for a phrase and know, okay, at this point in the meeting, this is what happened. Let me go back and just capture that one snippet of the meeting that I'm interested in. Instead of having to sit there for an hour meeting or listen to, you know, how often do you listen to a meeting recording, right? You've all been in a meeting that you missed and somebody sends the recording out after the meeting. You know, be honest, how often do you listen to that record? I almost never do, it's very, very rare. But if you could look through the transcript really quick and see some key phrases that look interesting to you and just click on it and play back that five minutes of the meeting, or if the AI was smart enough to know that that part of the meeting is interesting to you because it knows what you're working on and it could recommend, hey, just check out these five minutes of the meeting that we think is interesting to you, how much better would that be, right? You've saved a lot of time and the platform has taken care of doing a lot of that legwork for you. So these are the areas that we're looking at to make that meeting experience that much better to save you time and reduce that fatigue of sitting through meetings. Um, a lot of times you're in a meeting with a lot of people and you don't know who that person is. So we wanna give you insights into who the people are. And it takes a lot of AI to figure that out. If somebody in your meeting is called John Smith, you know, how many millions of John Smiths are there? I could go to LinkedIn and try to find John Smiths. Well, we have some AI and intelligence to try to figure out who that person actually is and give you information about who they are um, using just public information that's available. Now, that could start start saying a little big brotherish to people and, oh, you're my privacy. So everything is very, very privacy minded in everything that we do. We definitely think that privacy is a fundamental right and we're not going to infringe on people's privacy ever. And then Slido, as you're all experiencing right now, making a meeting like this a little bit more interactive, keeping people engaged, making sure that um, not only are they paying attention, but they're really listening to what you're saying and, and having to provide feedback into the meeting really makes it a much more engaging experience. So there's a lot more coming in the way of audience engagement and keeping people um, engaged in your meetings. Now, in addition to all that, inclusivity is really, really important. So we want to make sure, I, I mentioned this already, like making sure that in certain scenarios, you give people a chance to talk because a lot of people might not be the one to raise their hand and say, I want to say something. But if you go around and do a round table, like force it to say, hey, you know, Brenda, what do you think right now? And bring people out of their shells. We're going to have better experiences because the more feedback you get, the more people involved in decision making, the better things are. There's nothing worse than just one person in the meeting talking the whole time and nobody can get a word in and give their, their opinion. But if you give people the chance, a lot of times they, they do have something to say, they just don't feel like speaking up and saying it. Um, and then as things move across the globe, language is gonna be incredibly important. So the ability to translate in real time and provide closed captioning in real time and even sign language, ASL support in the platform automatically different speech channels so you can have a real-time translator and actually listen to the Spanish version of the audio stream for this meeting. You know, we could have somebody translating for me right now and you could be listening on an, on an audio stream that's in Spanish. So including people across language boundaries is really important as well. And then the ability to do 
um, feedback. You know, we have a feature you can do a thumbs up and it'll pop a little emoji and things like that. Um, also extending meetings outside your company as well. So when we have, for example, an event like this where we're bringing people from the outside and trying to share something, you might have thousands of people attending. So how do we bring these events out to the public in a way that is still engaging and provides um, the scalability that we need, or perhaps even live streaming? We just acquired a company called Socio, which provides in-person and virtual um, conferences and events. So we're gonna be able to host events like our Cisco Live event using this platform and offer it in such a way that is hybrid. So it'll have scheduling, it'll tell you how to get to your room, but it'll also connect you to other people virtually, allow you to get into the virtual sessions. And we're gonna be able to offer a lot of integration across the on-premise and the virtual world for large scale events. So I'm really excited about this one um, when we start integrating this into the portfolio because I think virtual events are, are here to stay. I think we've seen there's been a lot of success. But at the same time, a lot of people wanna go back to Las Vegas and drink at night and you know after you go through the conference, right? So that's not going away. In-person conferences are, are gonna come back for sure, probably come back with a vengeance. But instead of the 20,000 people that attended that conference, maybe we include 200,000 people, the same 20,000 people that are attending, but another 180 that are attending virtually at the same time and getting almost as good or maybe just as good of an experience minus the drinking um, through that virtual platform. So I think this is the way things are gonna go in the future as well. All right, we've got another question here. So 25 people have joined. And the question is, what percentage of participants on a conference call are less likely to multitask if they turn their camera on? So less likely to multitask if they have their camera turned on. All right, let's see what the results are. And most people said about 50-50. The answer, if I can click here. There we go. The answer is actually 82% which uh, that was actually higher than what I thought as well. So 82%. So if we can get people to just turn their camera on, they're going to probably be a lot more engaged because, you know, just social factors, right? I'm being watched now. I need to be paying attention. But it also makes it a much more engaging conversation. It's not just about, you know, okay, I, I want to make sure that you're still working. The reality is that video makes any conversation you have a thousand times better than if you're just having a, a, an audio conversation. Um, you know, I just had my my one-on-one. -on -one, so David's my manager. I just had my one-on-one -on -one with him, and he's got some lighting issues in his room, so he tends to turn off his camera at certain times of the day because it blinds him. And and you know, for me, it wasn't as engaging of a conversation because I couldn't see his face. Um, so definitely having video makes this virtual environment a lot better. But we need to make sure people are not just okay with turning on their cameras, but are in an environment that gives them good quality lighting, that gives them good quality video, that they have the bandwidth to actually send that video and it actually looks good without chopping out their audio. And now they sound bad and they look bad, right? So it reminds me of those, I don't know if you've seen those AT&T commercials where they show like the, They'll have a, a video call and then part of the conversation gets chopped off. So the meaning completely changes because of the little snippet that was missed. So the, the woman goes into a, co a, a dinner as thinking that it's a costume party because the woman said it's not a costume party, but the word not got cut out. So we need to make sure that the experience is good because then you could lose things in the conversation as well. All right. So. Kimberly, uh, you are the, the champion today. You got three out of four questions correct and you uh, took 51 seconds total time to answer. So congratulations. Looks like the, the hardest question of the day was on average, how much money for your new business is saved? So only 25% of you got that correct. Um, but thank you all for, for participating in this poll and we hope you had a good time there as well. Now, We've talked a lot about software and cloud and all these things, but we do think that there's a hardware component that is essential. And you might think of this like the, the Apple model, right? 
that they think that selling hardware and software that works better together is really critical. At the same time, we're gonna sell solutions that make use of, of the existing hardware that you have. But having a combination of hardware and software can really enhance that experience in the workspace. So you can have things like digital signage that can tell you, you know, what's going on in that building today or what events are happening. You can have interactive kiosks that will tell you which conference rooms are currently available. Um, as we start returning back to work, we might still have rules about mask wearing or social distancing or room occupancy. So we can actually use sensors with our cameras, with IoT to say there's too many people in this room. Some of you need to leave because you're not following guidance. Um, but there, it could just tell you that the cafeteria is pretty empty right now. Maybe it's a good time to go get lunch because the line is short as well. So just make, giving you the information about what's going on in that hybrid environment is really useful, as well as contextual notifications. So when you're walking by something, maybe you'll get a pop-up saying, um, do you want to log into this device because it detects that you're in that room? Or do you want to start a meeting um, because, again, you've walked into a conference room, et cetera? So having that information is really important. But just as important as it is to have IT people have information, it's have the workplace people have the information, as I mentioned before, so they can optimize that space to know, where do I need to put more desks? Where do I need to um, change the size of the room, break this room into three different rooms because I need more rooms with smaller space, et cetera. And that's gonna all make the workspace more intelligent with sensors, with intelligent wayfinding to tell you how to get to that conference room. The ability to automatically check in, you walk into the building, it finds a desk that's available for you and tells you, hey, go to desk A5, whatever it is. And you just walk there and it's ready to go without you having to do things. All right. So the last question of the day, and then I'm gonna hand it back um, to Carlos for some closing thoughts is, is your organization considering shifting some of that workspace budget? So remember we said we're gonna save a ton of money from people having remote work. Should we shift some of that money to perhaps buy some equipment to make that, that remote work a little bit more effective, whether it be enhancing their Wi-Fi or giving them a video device or a better camera or a headset or something like that. So shifting money from workspace money into funding technology for their home. So it seems like um, most people are, are saying yes right now. Some people are not sure, one person's saying no, but this is one of the conversations that we're starting to have with customers. And they're thinking, well, I'm gonna save money, but again, at what cost, right? If the experience is not good, then you've saved money just to make a worse experience. So Maybe you should take a little bit of that money savings and actually invest it into the technology to make the experience better. So remember, work is not what you do. It's what you do. It's not where you go, right? So we can work from anywhere. And like Carlos said, innovation happens everywhere. So Carlos, I'm going to hand it back to you for closing thoughts. And Thank you very much. I don't know if we have any questions either, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, ask them. Actually, we do have a couple. So we do have one that says, is this a post-COVID vision? And um, I think, yes. So we're thinking about how things look after COVID, right? Um, so definitely I would say that. And um, there was another question that was asked, how, how do you give an example how we get 10 better experience than in person? And I think hopefully some of the examples that I gave um, about all those different experiences and inclusivity and features that we're adding, um, give you some idea of how we're gonna make that better. And we're just gonna continue innovating. We're not done yet, we're just getting started and there's a long way to go to get there. Thank you very, very much, Paul and Dave. Uh, you know, a couple of things particular, particularly resonated with me in terms of the quote, you know, when, when, when you mentioned, Paul, I live at work. Or, or however you phrase that, that's, uh, you know, super powerful. And, and you know, clearly, um, you know, there's the, the typical saying of, I work to live and not live to work applies here. And uh, it's a little bit on us to figure, um, you know, how, how to continue to use technology and non-technology to, uh, 
you know, set that uh, barrier and integration on, on what's work and on, on what's life. You know, Viviana, I know we are a minute and a half eating into the networking piece. So uh, I will I will pass uh, the, the speaking uh, token back to you in, in 20 more seconds. But I do want to say thank you for, for this engagement today. Um, my uh, parting call to action is one to innovate, like, like Paul was describing. Uh, well, we are living uh, right now this post-COVID hybrid model, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it, it really is us at the center of using this technology, doing this work. Um, let's allow ourselves to be empowered to innovate. So passing it back to you, Viviana, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Amazing. Yes, let's empower ourselves to innovate. We need to do that more. We have it within us. So thank you for that powerful message. To Carlos, David, Paul, and the Cisco team, thank you for sharing all of this incredible information, information and opening up our minds to how we can look at the future of work. Um, I think there's so much to look forward to for an inclusive and connected work experience. And this was so fantastic. So thank you so, so much for joining us here today. Um, as Carlos mentioned, we're going to continue into our networking session. So if you can, please stay. But if not, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you at the next High Tech Live. Mi gracias. Thank you.